Hello everyone, in this video we are going to talk about blindsight, a curious, mind-boggling, perplexing neurological condition where patients can't consciously see, so if you ask them, they are literally blind. But subconsciously, they still take in visual information about the movements of objects around them and practically behave as if they wouldn't be blind. Hence, blindsight, cortically blind people that nonetheless subconsciously see. This phenomenon is striking because it clearly challenges the common sense belief that uh, what we see has to enter our consciousness in order to affect our behavior. This goes for other perceptions as well. Uh, we now know that smell has a significant effect on us, even though most of the time we are not aware of any smells. But the fact that your eyes take in information and feed your subconsciousness without you, know, you having any awareness of it uh, that's a very uncomfortable idea. So in this video I want to explore this idea and provide as many uh, interesting uh, stories and examples of the phenomenon. But I want to uh, begin this video with a historical overview. I want to go back to when we first uh, discovered this phenomenon called blindsight. So let's go back to the First World War. The First World War was a devastating affair. Following an initial period of mobile warfare, trench warfare became the dominant setting for the battles at the Western Front. The armies protected themselves in extensive lines of earth that were dug by the soldiers, which began the most lethal phase of the Great War. Many soldiers fell victim to shell explosions, machine gun fire and toxic gas, hygiene was precarious, trenches were infested with parasites and vermin, and soldiers were constantly exposed to infectious diseases. So soon after the beginning of the war, soldiers on both sides started to present in large numbers with neurological symptoms such as dizziness, tremor, paraplegia, tinnitus, amnesia, weakness, headache and mutism of psychosomatic origin. This condition became known as shell shock or war neurosis. This presented the neurologists and psychologists across Europe with immense and never seen before quantities of unheard of clinical disorders that vastly exceeded the explanatory power of early 20th century medicine. One neurologist that described some perplexing phenomena of patients blinded by gunshot wounds was George Ridoc. As he reported, the patients who were blinded by damage done to the primary visual cortex could somehow be conscious of seeing objects move, even though they were cortically blind. This led to some curious observations of those blind veterans that, for example, would use a rocking chair or just the movement of their head so that the non-moving surroundings would be put to relative motion to their head, which would allow them in some sense to see. This phenomenon is now called Ridoc syndrome, one of the many conditions on the spectrum of different types of blind sight. It wasn't until the early 70s that a lot of new insight into the phenomenon of blindsight was gathered when different researchers observed that if forced to guess about whether a stimulus is present in their blind field, some observers do better than chance. Also around then, more striking examples of blindsight were discovered in some experiments on monkeys. Especially one monkey named Helen could be considered the star monkey of visual research because she was the original blindsight subject. After they removed her primary visual cortex completely, she obviously got blind. Nevertheless, under certain situations, Helen exhibited sighted behavior. Her pupils would dilate and she would blink at stimuli that threatened her eyes. Furthermore, under certain experimental conditions, she could detect a variety of visual stimuli, such as the presence and location of objects, as well as shape, pattern, orientation, motion and color. In many cases, she was able to navigate her environment and interact with objects as if she were sighted. So it seems that even though none of the visual information about her surroundings were given to her consciousness, 
her subconsciousness did take in all of that and took care of all of the processes that were needed for normal behavior. Since then, researchers applied a similar type of tests that were used to study blind sight in animals to human test subjects. In 2003, a patient known as TN lost use of his primary visual cortex after he had two successive strokes which knocked out the region in both his left and right hemispheres. After in 2008, researchers began to notice that the patient exhibited signs of blind sight, they decided to test their theory. They took Tien into a hallway and asked him to walk through it without using the cane he always carried after having the strokes. Tien was not aware at the time, but the researchers had placed various obstacles in the hallway to test if he could avoid them without conscious use of his sight. And to the researchers' delight, he moved around every obstacle with ease, at one point even pressing himself up against the wall to squeeze past a trash can placed in his way. After navigating through the hallway, TN reported that he was just walking the way he wanted to, not because he knew anything was there. Another interesting case study is about a girl that brought her grandfather to a neurologist after he had a stroke. And uh, what happened is that the grandfather lost all of his um, sight uh, except for a tiny part of his visual field just in the middle and um, basically the neurologist took uh, the cane of uh, the patient and uh, thinking that he might have blind sight he uh, gave him the cane uh, but outside of this tiny spot of visual field that um, the patient had and asked the patient to grab the cane and of course uh, the patient the grandfather was like well i'm blind uh, i mean i'm blind for except for this tiny spot in front of me if if you put the cane like this i'm i'm not seeing it i can't take it but the neurologist was like well try just try to take it anyways without looking at it and so uh, the grandfather did just take the cane just perfectly coordinated his hands to take it and he thought that it might have been luck so the neurologist said let's try again and now again he gave him the cane but outside of his visual field and again asked him can you take it and again the patient just took it with the perfect coordination and now just to make sure then the neurologist took the cane again and put it in like a weird position so that uh, obviously the patient would have to turn his uh, hand to take the cane properly and as he did that, and asked the patient to take it, not too much of his delight, the patient did actually like make the proper movement and just take the cane as if he would see it. So even though the patient didn't have any direct awareness of anything that was happening outside this tiny spot in his visual field, uh, his subconsciousness still took all of the information about what's going on in his visual field. And once... Um, there was some practical task to his done he could actually you know do whatever has to be done he uh, exhibited sighted behavior even though uh, consciously he only saw a tiny fraction of the world in front of him so why does all of this happen as of now we have three major explanations for the phenomena of blindsight one states that when we think that the person's primary visual cortex is uh, completely damaged it might be in fact true that there are tiny islands of functioning tissue that remained and then these islands aren't enough to provide conscious perception but nevertheless they are enough for some unconscious visual perception. The other two explanations are that either after the damage done to the primary visual cortex other branches of the optic nerve start to deliver visual information to other parts of the brain, which in turn, those areas might then control the blind sight responses. Or it might be the case that the information required to determine the distance and velocity of an object and an object space is determined by another part of the brain. And only then after that information is being processed, it is being projected to the visual cortex. When the visual cortex is damaged, you don't get this conscious projection, but nonetheless the determination of distance and velocity stay.
Picking apart the experience of blindsight may reveal further clues about the power of the unconscious mind. Imagine that you are part of some strange puppet show where you have been blindfolded and your limbs are tied to invisible strings and then every so often they are tucked here and there by a hidden puppet master, leading you through a complicated dance. Then to the audience, it will seem like you are in full control of your actions, but you don't have the foggiest idea of what you've just done. And that puppet show is essentially what happens when someone with blindsight navigates their way past obstacles, with an unconscious mind acting as the puppet master. This goes to show that awareness isn't the whole story behind our behavior, and very often, when we believe that we have decided something, our brain has already made the decision for us. In that view, consciousness is just a summary of all the information coming in, but the fact that the subconscious can guide behavior suggests that elaborate processing is going on without us being aware of it. Some philosophers have gone as far as to claim that we could be little more than zombies acting on mostly unconscious impulses. This in turn begins to cast doubt on some long-held assumptions about the very nature and purpose of consciousness. So maybe understanding the phenomena of blindsight might need us to rethink some of our most fundamental ideas about the human mind. Okay, and that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. Uh, I just really wanted to explore this interesting phenomenon of blindsight, even though I'm not a uh, well, a neuroscientist and or cognitive scientist for that matter. Um, so of course. Uh, uh, you are very much invited to check out the links and uh, uh, sources that I have linked in, in the description. Um, but yeah, uh, that's just a very interesting, philosophically speaking, a very interesting phenomenon. And um, yeah, I'm just happy I got to explore it. I, I'm happy I have this YouTube channel, so I have like a practical reason so I can actually put in the work and, um, you know, put it to some use. Uh, so yeah yeah just i'm very happy about this youtube channel uh, thank you for watching uh today is also uh, well it happens to be just two years since i uploaded my first philosophical video uh, occam's razor uh, my first try at youtube and uh, the only time i i succeeded to convince the algorithm to like me apparently uh so yeah uh, that's it for today just wanted to share that uh, information about Bibliothopla and everything. Thanks for sticking by, thanks for all the support, I uh, appreciate that a lot. So uh, thank you, uh, see you in the next video.